All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. And as part of the Rankin Technical College AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies course, I am creating a series of video presentations based on the Mozilla Developer Network Learn Web Development series. We're up to server side programming, and we're going to have an introduction to the server side right now. All right, and again, this is your how-to type of thing. What is it? How does it work, etc. All right, most large-scale websites use server-side code to dynamically display different data when needed. Generally, pull out of a database stored on a server and sent to the client to be displayed with some code. So again, you know, I go out to a place like Amazon.com and I go into their books. And I say that I want a book on Node.js. Well, what do they have to do? They have to go through their database to see what books they have, right? And let's assume for a second that I want this book. All right. Then they have to go and look and see whether or not it's in stock. And if it is, now I'm able to go in and order it. All right. And if it's not, they will let me know when it will be in stock or if I order it, when I could get it available. They're asking if I want a hard copy or an electronic copy here. They're saying that they're, you know, again, they're, it says with other sellers, I'm not even sure. In that case, it looks like it is just these. But occasionally they'll have uh, books in here that'll be, that will have, um, you know, it'll say from a certain thing where they've, they've got, for example, they'll have used copies. But the point is not that. The point is this. The system had to go out in some way. It had to pull that data out of a database, store it on a database server someplace, and send it back to me. All right. And they mentioned here perhaps the most significant benefit of this is it allows you to tailor website content for individual users. So if somebody else comes in and they want, you know, they want books, and they could care less about Node, but they want a, a book on the C sharp programming language. They can put that in and they can get that information. All right. Dynamic sites can highlight content that is more relevant based on user preferences and habits. It can even allow interaction with users on the site, sending notifications via email or other channels. So if a book wasn't available, you know, I could ask, for example, that I be notified when it becomes available. All right. In the modern world of web development, learning about server-side development is highly recommended. I'd say, you know, and this is my opinion, for whatever it is or is not worth, that it's essential. All right, web browsers communicate with web servers using HTTP. Now, HTTP is kind of the language of the web. It's the hypertext transfer protocol. So look at it this way. And that is, let's see, let's get rid of that. And I'm going to give you some very crude art here. So this is you. And let me make this a lot bigger. So that's you at your browser. All right. So you sit there and at your browser, you know, you key in, for example, rankin.edu so you key that in what ends up happening is after you hit enter you will send an http request i should let's make it in capital letters http request that request will go to a rankin server some kind of a rankin server all right, and it will give you either right away or quickly, all right, it will give you back some kind of an HTTP response. So in other words, and let me hit enter here, and there's, there'll be a reason you'll see why in just a second. This is going this way, and this
is going that way. And it's even more than that. And what I mean is, when I go out to rankin.edu, so if I type in rankin.edu, you may or may not notice, have noticed, but it's not an HTTP request, it's an HTTPS request and response. So it's secure, in other words, okay? And the idea is, this is me doing this, this is Rankin answering, all right? And that's pretty much what they're starting to show right here. So when you click a link on a web page, when you submit a form, when you run a search, when you put something in an address bar and you hit ent in enter, you're making either an HTTP or an HTTPS request from your browser to a server someplace. The request, as it says, includes a URL identifying what you're looking for, a method that defines the required action, and may include additional information. Again, we'll go over all this stuff as we go on. Web servers, as it says, they're sitting in wait. They're waiting for client request messages. When they arrive, they've got to do one of two things. They've either got to answer them directly or they have to take, and if they don't have that information, they have to make a, basically they have to make a request to a different server so they can get that information back from the server so that they can send that information back to the user. Now it says the picture that's shown here shows a basic web server architecture for a static site. Now look at a static site as being like this, all right? The site that we're about to create or that we'll create soon for this, can you call me Mo for, you know, again, based off of these commercials that I've seen on TV for Missouri is going to be a static site. And what that means is there really won't be a lot of dynamicity in the site. We may set it up so that we've got a running slideshow and or we may set it up so we get the time back and something else. But the point is, as it says, this site will return the same hard-coded information all the time. And it says, when a user wants to navigate to a page, the browser sends a GET request. GET is an accessor. It's as though I'm in class. It's the first day of class. A student walks in, and I said, hi, what's your name? And the student says, my name is Mary. That's a GET request. I'm getting their name. Let's suppose that in that class, I have four people named Mary. So the next one walks in and says, hi, my name's Mary, and the next one, and the next one. Well, let's, let's you know, with four Marys, it would get very hard to, you know, to know who's who. So let's say I called one of them Mary, one of them, let's say, was Mary Ann, one of them was Mary Jane, and one of them, let's just say, was Mary Beth, something like that, all right? Then... If I say, hey, Mary number one, you'll be Mary. Mary number two, you'll be Mary Jane, etc. That's not a get request. That's more or less a post type of request. That's when I'm giving information. So when you're getting information, when you are requesting it, it's a get. And as it says there, the server retrieves the requested document from this file system and it returns the response, ideally re returning the document and also some kind of a success status. If the document was successfully returned, it'll return something either 200 or something in the 200 realm. But if it cannot return it, an error status is returned. Typically, for instance, if I if I put in this, let's just say I was in a hurry and I put in raken.edu, and it came back and it said, this cannot be reached. Check to see if there's a typo in there. All right, if it is correct, you can do other things. But the point is, it's a file not found. All right, I'm trying, I'm asking for something that doesn't exist. So that's what it looks like when you're talking about a static site. With a dynamic site, you'll notice there's more involved because typically with a static site, all right, the, the user is here. I've mentioned this before. The user makes their request. It goes to a web server. The web server typically will has got some canned files that it's able to get and return back to the user as an HTTP response. 
but with a dynamic website, as it says, it's one where some, most, maybe almost all of the responses generated dynamically as needed. Here, as it says, the pages are normally created by inserting data from a database into placeholders. It can return different data based on the information provided by the user. You saw an example when I went out to Amazon and first asked for node.js and, you know, and made that request and then made another request when I asked for C-sharp. And you notice that in both cases, I got, in each case, I got different information returned. Most of the code to support a dynamic website must be run on the server. Creating code like this is known as server-side programming, also known as back-end scripting. So when you talk about front-end and you talk about back-end, all right, the front-end is the stuff that's done on the user's machine. In fact, they're going to talk about client-server either in here or in the next one of these that we go through. And we will talk about, we may or may not talk about thin client and thick client. The thinner the client, the more the work is being done on the server and the less it's being done on the client. The thicker the client, the more work is being done on the client and the less is being done on the server. So this diagram, as mentioned, shows a simple architecture for a dynamic website. Again, the browser sends the HTTP request, all right, just like it did before. But then the server processes the request, and typically it doesn't have the information right at, its, right at its disposal. So it has to go and request that information, get that information, so it can then send it back to the client. So as it says, results for static resources are handled in the same way as for static sites. All right. But the requests are inserted or forward to the server side code. For dynamic requests, as it mentions right there, the server interprets the request, reads the required information from the database, combines the retrieved data with HTML templates, and sends back a response. All right. I think I can get all this done in one taping here. So what can you do on the server side? As it says there, server side program is useful because it allows you to efficiently deliver information tailored to individual users. If, if I go as an instructor in the application and website development program, if I go out to Amazon, I'm probably going to be looking for books on programming or website design etc. If my boss, Mr. Corrigan, goes out to Amazon, he may be looking for books on Windows administration or Cisco or CompTIA. All right. And as it says, we can both go out to Amazon and, and it will efficiently deliver information to us delivered to what we're asking for, which results, as it says, in a much better user experience. Companies like Amazon use this to construct search results for products. So another person might come out and maybe the electronics instructor doesn't want a book, but wants some kind of an electronic toolkit. All right. Also, as you notice, it says it can give you suggestions. So if I go out to Amazon again, all right, they may or may not notice related to items you viewed. Now, this is good business sense for them, and it makes sense for me as well. What I mean by this is it's good business sense for them because let's suppose I just bought this book called Node.js Design Patterns. And now I say, hey, this looks like it could be good, Node.js Web Development. Well, it's possible then that they're going to find a, a book, another book, that they're going to be able to sell me. So it's good for them that way. It's also good for me. Because I might say, oh, gee, I didn't even know this resource existed. So ideally, it's a win-win type of situation. All right. Banks use server-side programming to store account information and allow only authorized users to make and view transactions. You probably have seen things, commercials on TV, where you can typically take a picture of a check that you've received, 
take a picture of the front, endorse it on the back and take a picture there, send it in and boom, it'll be put right into your account. And that is really nice, especially for people, let's just say for people who don't drive, whether they're elderly or they just never learn how to drive, but they want to be able to, you know, do their banking. A lot of people do their stuff electronically. Some of the common uses and benefits of server-side programming are listed below. You'll notice, as it says, there is some overlap. Server-side programming allows us to store information in a database and dynamically construct and return HTML and other types of files. It is also possible to return data, typically in the form of JSON, which is JavaScript object notation, but also possibly in XML, the extensible markup language for rendering by appropriate client-side web framework. The server is not limited to sending information from databases. It may alternatively return the result of software tools or communications that it has with, your know, data that it has with communication services. Because the information is in a database, it can also be more easily shared and updated with others. It says your imagination doesn't have to work hard to see the benefit of this. And the example that they give in here isn't that different from the one I just went over. All right. So not only do you get the efficient storage and delivery of information, as it says, and you've already seen, you get a customized user experience. I can get what I want. They give an example here about Google Maps. So if I go to Google Maps, all right, and I search, and I say that I want to go visit my brother-in-law, who, and this is true, he lives in Mississippi, I can put that in there. All right, if I want to go and visit my uh, one of my other brother-in-laws who lives in, where is he? He lives in some suburb of Madison, Wisconsin, I can put that in there. Also, you know, for things like when you think about this, it's kind of the way your GPS works. It provides a list of previously visited or popular locations you might want to take a look at. All right. It provides controlled access to content. Server-side programming, as it says, allows site to restrict access to authorized user, users and serve only the information they're permitted to see. So with Facebook, I can go in. So I can go out to Facebook. All right and I can get information. But let's say that, for example, there's somebody that I don't know. So I'm gonna say John, and it shows me some Johns that I'm familiar with, but how about John Bronson? I don't know a John Bronson, but I put that in, and okay, there's a John Bronson right there. Okay, and it says, it's only gonna show me a limited amount of information. All right, and then it'll tell me, it'll, it'll say, do you know John? And if I don't, or if I do rather, I can send John a friend request. But other than that, it's not going to show me a lot of intimate photos of John that wouldn't make sense. All right. Now, are there uh, deviations from that? Are there exceptions to the rule? Of course. Some people take their life and put it out on social networks like Facebook. All right. So it says the site you are on right now controls access to content. Articles are visible to everyone, but only the users who have logged in can edit them. So in another example of that, not exactly what they're talking about, but let's say I go out to Wikipedia. All right, and I'm going to put in here node.js. It's going to give me the Wikipedia page on node.js. I can look at this. I myself cannot come in there and make changes to this page. Now, if I get myself an account, I might be able to go in and edit it, all right? So it says you are not logged in. Your IP address will be publicly visible if you make any edits. If you log in or create an account, your edits will be attributed to your username. Even with that, there's probably only certain things I can change in here. So if I disagreed with something that was in here, all right, if I didn't like something that was in there, if I thought, hey, you know, it, I, it runs, let's just say that somebody had put in here that runs on the V7 engine. I thought like, that's wrong, that's V8. 
I believe I would have to log in to be able to change that. I can't just willy nilly get on there and change it. Oops, now I removed. Sorry about that. All right, we're here. Come on. And this is where we are. All right. They mentioned consider other real world examples where your content is controlled. For example, you know, if you go into your, online to your bank, you can see your account information, you can't see other people's. All right. Storing session and state information. Server-side programming allows developers to make use of sessions. As it says, it's a mechanism that allows the server to store information on the current user of a site and send different responses based on that information. As an example, it says it knows that a user has previously logged in and displays links to their emails or order history. I can go into my email account, but unless with my wife, you know, who's got a Gmail account, if I don't know what her password is, I can't go in there and look at her, her mail. All right. Notifications and communication, as they mentioned right there, servers can send general or user-specific notifications. So, for example, I've got some stuff turned on on my Facebook account that when certain people post messages, I usually get a message down here. All right. Amazon, as it says, regularly sends product emails that suggest products. You've already seen some of that. A web server might send warning messages to site administrators at, you know, telling them information. All right. I get information that, for example, when the web server or the servers at Rankin Technical College are going to be backed up. All right. Finally, data analysis. A website may collect a lot of data about users, what they search for, what they buy, etc. Says if you're a Facebook user, go to your main feed and look at a stream of posts. Now, if I do go out to here and let's just go back to here and start looking in here, there's probably a pretty good chance. All right, it's probably a pretty good chance that um, sooner or later I'm going to start seeing. You know, I'm trying to teach myself and, and getting lessons. I'm playing guitar, so I get all this stuff all the time about different guitar sites. All right. Facebook is based on some of the, the places that I've looked at, goes in and tries to help me or sell me something or whatever. So congratulations. You've reached the end of the first article about server side programming. You've now learned that server side code is run on a web server and its main role is to control what information is sent to the client. You should also understand that it is useful because it allows you to create websites that efficiently deliver information tailored to individual users should also understand that server-side code can be written in a number of programming languages. All right. So this is what we hit on and what's left now in this section. So we've done the first steps and we did the introduction to the server-side. Next is client-side overview. Come back with that shortly.